eliminating animal agriculture is the fastest and most powerful and least painful way to um, put the brakes on climate change. Hi, I'm Philippa Natal, Environmental Sustainability Editor at The New Statesman. And today I'm interviewing Pat Brown, who is CEO of Impossible Foods, a US food company which has managed to create meat and a burgers that taste more like meat than meat. Hi Pat, so thank you for being with us sure, today. Sure, thank you. Um, great to, to discuss this subject. So first of all, um, perhaps you could explain a bit more why you want to make a, a plant-based burger that essentially is like meat. Why can't we just eat plant-based foods that are accepted for what they are? Wow, that's a really good question. So um, first of all, I, I mean, I, I for four, 45 years of my life, have eaten plant-based foods that are just things that I make myself, and, and they're great, and I have zero interest in something that tastes like meat. On the other hand, you know, 95% plus of the population in the U.S. and probably the world um, uh, are regular meat consumers. And they have all the same options that I eat every day, and yet they're not choosing to eat them. And that's because they um, are used to and love eating uh, meat and fish and dairy foods and so forth, the foods we make from animals. And they're not interested in lentils or tofu or whatever as an alternative. So I got into this entirely because I, I wanted to completely uh, eliminate animal agriculture worldwide, or basically the use of animals as a food technology worldwide. And um, I realized that the only way to do it was to make, to develop a new technology platform that outperformed the current technology in delivering what consumers want from um, their animal-derived foods, which includes, above all, deliciousness, and not just deliciousness in the sense of, well, I happen to think lentils are delicious, but deliciousness as meat, okay? And um, nutritional value, in the case of meat, people value the protein, iron, and so forth. Uh, and convenience and affordability. So my thesis was if we can make products, if we can develop a technology platform that enables us to make uh, products from simple scalable plant ingredients that deliver all the values that meat lovers crave and compete in the marketplace, the industry will be gone. Um, eliminating animal agriculture is the fastest and most powerful and least painful way to um, put the brakes on climate change. When people in general talk about the impact of animal agriculture on climate, they're talking about the ongoing emissions, okay? Um, and the ongoing, and they're significant. I mean, they're, they're, you know, something on the order of 17% of total greenhouse gas emissions on an ongoing basis. What has been neglected is something that's much more important, which is that the emissions from animal agriculture are almost completely reversible. The emissions from fossil fuels are basically irreversible because, you know, once you've turned coal into carbon dioxide, there's no going back, basically. The carbon dioxide emissions from animal agriculture, historically, come almost entirely from la clearing land to make room for livestock. Now, if you could eliminate the incentive for covering that grass with sheep and cows, the opportunity, you have the opportunity to restore the original forest. And by doing that, essentially completely reverse the process. People are talking about uh, this issue as if, you know, we have plenty of time to deal with it, right? We need a radical change fast. And um, radically reducing fossil fuel emissions right now would be incredibly disruptive. If, if we said, okay, we're turning off your lights, your heat, and the transportation system, that would be extremely disruptive to the economy and society, obviously. That, that could be done, but it's not gonna happen immediately because it takes a while to build the alternative you know, energy systems. Eliminating animal agriculture. Now, if, you're, if you love meat and cheese and milk and 
fish and all those animal foods, you know, you're not going to be thrilled about the idea of replacing them in your diet. But if someone said, okay, if you, you have to replace that steak with some, you know, reasonable plant-based alternative, or we'll turn off your lights, we'll turn off your heat, we're going to, you know, get rid of your car and public transportation, which would you choose? Yeah, that's a very simplistic argument, though, isn't it? In the sense that nobody's actually saying we're going to take away people's cars. I mean, what we're saying is that we'll replace the internal combustion engine with an electric vehicle, for example, which no. obviously comes with certain of its own problems, but nobody is making that. Nobody is making that point, but here, here's what I'm saying, okay? Of course that's not going to happen. What I'm trying to um, say is that um, what I'm proposing is much less disruptive to people's lives and the economy. But now, this has been a really long-winded answer to a much simpler question. I'm sorry about that, but I think it's really important because otherwise it's just like, oh, someone's making plant-based foods to replace meat. The, the reason we're doing what we're doing is we have to make foods that outperform the animal in every way that matters to consumers. And we have proof of concept, I would say, We've made products now that in blind taste tests with hardcore meat consumers um, are preferred on taste alone over the animal products. Interesting. But are you actually suggesting then that in 15 years there will be no livestock on the planet? That's our goal and I think it's realistic. But surely that would be hugely disruptive. I mean, most of the world farming still remains, even if it's subsistence farming, remains probably one of the main, if not the main source of income around the globe. So in terms of a, a transition for these people and, and, and their jobs, what, what's the answer to that? Okay, I'm glad you asked that. So, um, because first of all, n nobody, including Impossible Foods, wants to create problems for farmers. And, and I'll just say, Subsistence farmers anyway, since our approach is market-based, if they're not part of the global you know, market for meat, they're, you know, people who are doing this for subsistence or for local, purely local economies, they're not going to be affected by impossible foods. And frankly, it's a very small fraction of animal agriculture globally and the impact of animal agriculture. So there's that. But, but for other farmers, like let's just say, take the UK, okay? Perfect example. UK used to be forested, okay? If there were a price, a reasonable price on carbon, like let's say, you know, economists talk about carbon pricing, and right now the markets are just a total joke. But I mean, it just, it's just mostly scams and, and nonsense, okay. But if there were a functional uh, carbon market where the price was sort of at the lower end of what economists think are required to, to incentivize changes that are consistent with you know, addressing climate change, pretty much every farmer who's raising livestock in England could make more money letting the trees recover. Because you can calculate at $50 a ton and based on the amount of carbon dioxide that could be fixed by recovering the, the original biomass on the land, what the revenue would be for those farmers. And it's way more than they make. And of course, as you probably know, if it weren't for subsidies, 70% of livestock farmers in the UK would be losing money every year. And with subsidies, 30% of them are losing money every year. So it's not exactly the most lucrative business to be in anyway. But it would be, you would have this much um, better source of income, and it would be vastly better for the planet to allow that, that biomass to recover. As far as consumers, the way that we're approaching it is, we're putting it on us, basically, to make sure that consumers are happier without the animal products. You know, I'd say we've proven pretty well that delicious meats don't have to come from animals. So um, that's my long-winded answer to why, even though, even though they, people could live perfectly healthy by eating existing plant-based foods that don't behave anything like meat, we're going to the trouble of making foods that taste exactly like meat, only better. But in terms of the dietary shift that's taking place at the moment, is it not a little bit like renewables in the sense that we're, we're bringing renewables on board, there's more wind, solar, electric vehicles than there has ever been? 
but at the same time we also have fossil fuels are not decreasing and emissions therefore are increasing and is that not the same thing that we have more plant-based products in our in our shops in our supermarkets but at the same time there are more and more massive <coughs> farms especially in the UK the US and other countries and again emissions from those those farms are not decreasing so in terms of achieving this in 15 years how are you going to do it at scale a lot of the um, um, renewable power sources actually are more economical than fossil fuel power in lots of parts of the world, okay? That's what's gonna decide it. It's, it's you know, it, you need innovation to basically make it the obvious choice for consumers who do not want to sacrifice the comfort and pleasure of their lives to avoid a climate catastrophe, but they'll look for the best deal they can get. I would, I would love it if, you know, governments would make the kinds of really decisive and rapid changes that we need to avoid this. But the only thing that can move that fast, reliably, is the market, basically. And, you know, when better technology comes along and it outperforms the incumbent technology in the ways that matter to consumers, change can happen fast. And, you know, the automobile effectively replaced the horse in the U.S. in about 15 years. I mean from almost entirely horses to almost entirely automobiles. And the digital camera, from the very first really crappy digital camera, um, commercial camera coming on till Kodak was bankrupt was about eight years. You, you have to use the market as your subversive tool to, to get the change you want. And I agree, but I used to be an agricultural journalist and I followed the, the many reforms of the common agricultural policy and the farm lobby in Europe is very powerful and that's even without thinking of the farm lobby in the US or Brazil. Yeah. So something needs to shift, not just the market, presumably. Why? Because, because uh, lobbies for special interests you know, can't compete against consumer demand, basically. I think the bottom line is if you have consumers on your side, because you're giving them a better value than they're getting from those lobbies. I think that you know, it's not very politically um, sustainable to be um, fighting against you know, the mass market. If we ever get to the point, which is, I think from a political standpoint, the best thing that politicians can do to make a decisive step toward addressing climate change that is, that is kind of uncontroversial, okay, would be to have an international consensus on um, standards for um, conditions that need to be met to claim a car carbon credit from, from some land-based carbon capture mechanism. Right now, it's basically, you know, I could say, okay, I'm holding this tree hostage, and I'm going to chop it down unless you pay me, okay? And that's a carbon credit, right? There's all kinds of ludicrous stuff that, that you know, people are claiming as carbon credits. But if you said, no, here's what you need. You need a verifiable by a standard method, which I think, you know, satellite imaging is probably a pretty good way, um, uh, method of measuring biomass accumulation in order to be able to claim credit for that, and, um, and a guarantee of permanence. So you can't just say, okay, I'm going to save this tree, now I'm going to chop it down, and now I'm going to save it again, and just keep that pump going and claim credits. If you, had, if you had simple, obvious standards to the market, I think that market would, would become way more functional and people who don't want to participate in it because it's such a scam would be more willing to engage with it. I think if that happened and there was a reasonable price on, on carbon credits, which I, I really do believe will happen, the value of land for carbon capture at $50 a ton is substantially greater than the value of that land in the market, okay? And if we come to the consumer side, um, there's, uh, within the environmental world, there's, there's, uh, there seems to be a bit of a schism at the moment in some environmentalists who say, great, you know, we can have any kind of plant-based burger. And then there's a bit of controversy, especially in Europe and the UK, around impossible foods because you insert a GMO into your burgers and, and the public discourse around GMOs in, in Europe and the UK is very um, political, it's very divisive. Um, and if you ask lots of people, they would say, I never want to eat GMO foods, they're bad for my health, they're bad for the planet. Mm -hmm. um, there's this label of Franken foods. Mm -hmm. um, 
So how do you respond to that and how do you work with environmentalists who, from what you said, should be on your side, who mm -hmm. don't support your product? First of all, there's a, pretty much among legitimate scientists universal consensus that there's absolutely nothing um, inherently problematic about genetic engineering. There's no legitimate reason to worry about it. That's number one. Um, secondly, we figured out a way to make um, meat that that satisfies people's craving for meat uh, in a way that, because we've actually figured out the, sort of the molecular mechanism of meat flavor, and it requires a heme protein that, that we have to produce at scale. There are two ways you could do that. You can produce it as we do by fermentation using uh, yeast that are genetically engineered to produce a lot of it, or you could cover the friggin' planet with cows and just more or less resign yourself to the complete collapse of biodiversity and, you know, and, and climate change. Which, 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 would you rather, which would you rather have? The whole thing is not a major driver of consumer behavior because you know, most of the cheese in the world is produced using a genetically engineered enzyme. You know, it used to be, come from the animal stomachs for the past 30 years. Most of the rennet in the world has been produced by genetically engineered yeast. And the EU has no, no they're not at all forbidden there. There's, you just have to go through a regulatory pro pro process, prove they're safe, and there's no problem. I think that, that it's just like in the US. You know, you hear all this no, noise about GMOs. You know, people are, are constantly consuming foods that have components that are produced gen by genetically engineering, and no one's dying, no one's, no one's really complaining. Um, I don't think it's as, as deep, deeply rooted as, as people think. But there would have to be regulatory change in the EU and the UK for your products to be sold here, or not? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We know exactly what the regulations are. Um, we know what boxes need to be checked so far. We know that the things that we did to get through the, you know, were, we were approved in the US by the FDA, by the Canada version of the FDA, by the Australia, New Zealand equivalent of the FDA, FSANS. Um, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in the UAE, everywhere that we've gone through the process, um, we've gotten out successfully, okay, with basically no real speed bumps. Because we know exactly what's required, we've, done, we've generated all the data, submitted it, and um, we know what the regulations are. This is what you have to show, and we've shown it. It just, it just takes time. So when do you hope that we'll be able to see the first uh, Impossible Food products on the market in the, in the UK? Um, well... There's what I hope, and then there's what I realistically hope. I mean, I would hope it would be tomorrow, but, um, but I realistically hope it'll probably be, you know, in 2023 or late 2022, but sometime on the order of a year to a year and a half from now. But having said that, I don't control the time course of the, you know, bureaucratic process, but that's the, that's the typical time it takes from submitting your file to, to completing the regulatory process, so fingers crossed. And coming back to subsistence farmers quickly, um, there are obviously subsistence farmers in developing countries, but what about the, the, the farmer in, in the UK who's decided to convert his land to organic farming, who has some extensively farmed cows, organic milk that he's sell, selling to the local community? Is that okay in, in the new world or not? Okay, is I'm not going to make the judgment is okay, but what I would say is that you know there's this this notion that somehow you know if you have a nice grassy field as opposed to cages or something like that and um, uh, it's organic that it's it's not a climate problem, it's not a biodiversity problem. Utter nonsense, okay. The problem, the problem with, from both a climate and biodiversity standpoint, the number one problem is land. You have land, if you're, if you're using it to graze cattle, okay, um, it, it, it is not covered with um, perennial biomass um, that it used to be cover, covered with. In, in, in California, the places where cattle are grazing, there used to be, you know, uh, um, often quite dense oak trees, right? Now, ever since they started introducing cow cows into California, no acorn has ever grown into an oak tree because they all get munched on before, before they turn into a tree. 
So it has a huge impact on both the plant and animal biodiversity. So it's, you know, you can put an organic label on it. That does not mean it's not just as bad in terms of climate and biodiversity. And what about the ingredients uh, that go into your burgers? Because one of the uh, criticisms of uh, GMO foods, for example, which is, is not perhaps the case for you because of the type of GMO you use, but is that it leads to monocultures and we get these great big foils and that's actually the danger rather than um, I love that. agriculture. Is that something that is a real concern? Well, here's, here's a fact to consider in that argument, okay? Most of those monocultured crops are grown entirely to feed livestock, okay? You don't, no one complains about monocultured lettuce or, you know, squash or something like that. It's, it's mostly in reference to corn and soybeans that, that basically no human will ever uh, uh, consume directly as food. An interesting statistic, um, this year's soybean crop contains 50% more protein than all the meat and dairy products consumed globally. Okay, so what that means is you need, if you, make, if you were to make the replacements entirely from soy, not that that necessarily would be the case, you would need to grow less soybeans, okay, than you're growing now. So you're not promoting monocultured crops, you're largely eliminating the need for them, even if you're just, even if you're using soybeans as your primary ingredient, because what drives those crops and the massive scale of them is the incredible inefficiency with which they're turned into meat, right? I mean, a cow takes 30 grams of plant protein to produce one gram of beef protein, right? That's the reason why there's these giant monocultured crops. So, um, yeah, that argument just doesn't, doesn't work. Okay, great. Thank you mm. very much. Okay. Super interesting talking to you. And if you enjoyed that interview, Please go to the New Statesman's website, newstatesman.com, to read and watch other interviews, or you can subscribe to our YouTube channel.